Hi, I'm Scott Wimberly with Fabtech Systems, here with Dave Hughes, Clinical Director for Fabtech Systems, to show you how we cast for our reactive bracing system. Uh, in casting our reactive bracing system, one of the tools that you'll, you'll most likely need is a casting fixture. The casting fixture is how we ensure that when we make the reactive brace that we capture both the heel height that's needed as well as the applied toe rocker. Uh, this is going to be very important for the function of the brace and it's going to be something you're going to have to get right as you work. The casting system that, that we sell uh, has a set of heel spacers. Uh, the heel spacers come in quarter inch increments with also an eighth inch uh, spacer. So that gives you the ability to do an inth, inch and an eighth of heel height. And then we have a top sheet. Uh, the top sheet is a high density uh, plastic. Uh, that's a sixteenth of an inch thick. So with this we can do heights in sixteenth of an inch variables all the way up uh, past an inch and an eighth. So to do that what we're going to do is we'll position whatever heel, wed or heel height that we determine we need through the evaluation process. Uh, we'll apply our top sheet which is going to allow everything to conform and then we have our toe rocker wedge which is how we set how much toe rocker there is in the device. So when we're done with this, what we will have is we'll have the patient on the device, on the casting fixture, and then we'll be able to slide the toe wedge in to get the toe rocker that they were going for. For the reactive brace to properly function, the cast is going to have to capture the patient's neutral shin alignment while standing. In most cases, the patient's choice of footwear is going to dictate what that needed heel height is going to have to be. 3 8 heeled shoe, 3 8 inch heel height. However, in cases like bone on bone pain or failed fusion, it's really common to have to determine a specific heel height for the patient to keep them out of pain while standing and walking. Uh, before we can do any of this though, we have to do an evaluation and for that we're going to have Dave walk us through that process. To determine any special heel heights needed, we do an evaluation. I have the patient stand I move them back into plantar flexion and move them forward into dorsiflexion until they reach a bone-on-bone -bone painful spot. I usually test this three times to determine where that spot is. I then use the casting board or a heel wedge to come up with a proper angle. What I'm looking for is 90 degrees without hitting bone on bone pain. Once I determine the heel height to, to be able to achieve that 90 degrees, I add an extra 1 8 inch lift in order to allow a little bit of preloading motion so that I can move forward without impinging a bone on bone with dorsiflexion. Okay, we've already determined the proper heel height, which in this, um, for this patient will be 3 eighths of an inch. Uh, the first step in the casting process is to uh, remove the uh, shoe. We're going to apply two casting nylons. We want to run those up above the knee. The third layer will be a cotton stockinette. and we apply our cutting strip. Dave, is there any special consideration you make when placing the cutting strip? The cutting strip should be placed down the center of the foot and halfway up the shin, we want to cross to the lateral side. Is, is I want the I want the cutting strip to be located between the fibular head and the tibial tubercle so that I have good access to both these bony prominences. 
this will allow me to have the best access and the best casting shape over the anterior tibia. If I'm not able to see the tibial crest, um, I'm not able to create the proper relief within the uh, brace. The next step will be to identify our bony prominences. I'm very careful to mark the base of the fifth. If the base of the fifth is prominent on the planner surface, I want to mark it well in order to capture it for my modifications later. I mark the medial and lateral malleolus as well as the navicular. I don't mark any of the proximal landmarks until I do the second portion of the cast. I do this mold in two sections in order to capture and maintain the foot position on the casting board. Once that's set and hardened, then I cast the upper part of the, the leg. This allows me to really focus on uh, my alignment and my bony prominences with each section. I'll set the foot on the casting board to make sure I have my alignment and my position set up. Then I'll lift the patient's foot back up again, ask them to hold their foot at 90 degrees if they can. and start my wrap. How many rolls of wrap do you typically use? Typically I use two rolls of Delta Light fiberglass. If it's a larger leg, I'll use a portion of a three inch roll as well. So do you make any special considerations with how tight you're doing the wrap to keep from crunching the forefoot? Um, I want to make sure that I'm not wrapping too tight across the forefoot and um, crushing in ML on the toes or the forefoot. I want to make sure I have good coverage over the heel and I want to make sure I cast to the ends of the toes so that I have the full foot in the mold. I'm going to smooth that all in and then I'm going to put the patient's foot back on the casting board and make sure that the third rocker wedge is in proper position. I want to make sure that my angle is at 90 degrees and that I have proper alignment ML. Sometimes I have to move the patient's foot in order to achieve that and, and make sure I have proper angles. In terms of ML alignment, I like to have the weight line fall from the center of the knee through uh, between the first and second toe. I make any kind of shift I need to achieve that. I also make sure that I mold into the arch area in order to maintain foot position and I quite often will give myself a little indentation on the lateral side in the perineal arch to help create a relief for my fifth metatarsal. I want to maintain my ankle position and maintain my arches. I'm always checking to make sure I maintain that 90 degree angle and I continue to hold until the fiberglass sets. It's very important to make sure that we maintain our alignment because it's much harder to do in the plaster model after the fact. It's very easy to capture it and maintain the proper position during the casting phase. I wait for the foot section to become fully set 
before I start with the upper part of the leg in the second phase of the casting. I do that to prevent the foot section from losing its uh, position, proper position. Once the fiberglass is set, I can lift the patient's foot straight up off the casting board. I move it out of the way and I transfer the patient to a casting stool. I want to do this so that I can maintain about a five degree flexion angle at the knee in order to uh, capture my upper PTB section. It is very important to extend the leg out to five degrees of flexion in order to better capture the PTB section. If the leg is flexed to 90 degrees when you're taking the mold, it makes it quite difficult to do the PTB casting without bunching behind the knee. If this occurs, it makes it very hard to modify later. Another very important part uh, when molding the upper section is to make sure you maintain the proper knee to foot alignment. It's very easy when casting this way to have the foot externally rotate and uh, throw off your alignment. So I'm very careful to check that and make sure that I maintain that alignment. Uh, the other very important thing to remember is that you don't have internal rotation of the foot uh, that the patient won't be able to tolerate within the brace. So I'm very careful to maintain my internal and external rotation. I like to mark the center of the kneecap so that I can maintain that throughout the casting. I mark the fibular head. I mark the tibial tubercle. I want to know where my patellar tendon is. And I'm very careful to mark the anterior tibia. I also like to mark the medial condyle as well. Using consistent landmarks will make it a lot easier to modify the brace I wrap the upper section snug through the medial tibial flare. I want to make sure I blend in the second layer of fiberglass into the first layer so that I'll hold my shape and my position. If the patient's a little taller, I'll use a partial roll. With the cutting strip located lateral on the leg, you have to be very careful not to use too much fiberglass or it makes it very hard to get the model off the patient's leg. I'm always checking my internal and external rotation to make sure I maintain the proper position. I spend a lot of time blending in the medial flare for support on the PTB section. I'm also careful to blend in the medial flare when I'm just doing an anterior shell as opposed to a PTB mold. Um, this helps maintain my tibia relief, which is very important with the carbon anterior shell. As the fiberglass starts to set, I'm blending in my medial flare. I also apply some pre-tibial pressure. I squeeze ML in order to create relief down the tibia. This works very well with both the PTB upper section and the anterior shell. You can see that as I squeeze the fiberglass as it's setting, it cr creates relief down my anterior tibia. 
and yet I'm still maintaining my medial flare and applying pretibial pressure. I like to just give myself a little bit of a marking on the patellar tendon. I am not very aggressive in this area because I don't want to distort my calf. I like to come back once the cast is set and remark some of my landmarks. I like to know where the anterior tibia is, the tibial tubercle, as well as the patella. I want to remark my anterior, which I can see through the fiberglass. I also like to give myself a second reference on my patellar tendon. I'll often put hash marks on to define my cutting strip. The next phase is to cut the cast off. Cut through the first layer of stockinette. And then remove my cutting strip. These casts are occasionally hard to remove from the leg due to the side placement of the cutting strip. Occasionally I'll ask the patient if they'll hold the top of the cast out so that I can focus on the lower section. And then we slide the leg out. So now that we've gotten a cast, uh, we need to go ahead and do an evaluation. Um, it's one thing to take a cast, it's another thing to make sure that you actually have a cast that's correct to work with. Dave's got a process that he uses after casting that he'll share with us. Uh, so generally I check the uh, dorsiflexion angle to make sure that I have the proper heel height and that set up on the proper heel height I can maintain my 90 degree angle. Um, I also check my third rocker to make sure that I have that in place. I also view the cast from the anterior to make sure that I have a proper alignment in the AP and we also want to make sure that a plumb bob through the center of the knee will drop down between the uh, first and second toe. One of the things that Dave did for us that's really good is he left us a good solid anterior reference so we have no questions about where the line of progression is for the limb. When we determine uh, the inversion and eversion placement of the foot uh, in fabrication that's going to be invaluable to us.